as Michal said, I'm Krzysztof, I'm from Virtus Lab. Uh, I'm mainly working on the tooling for huge scala repositories. So if you got, I don't know, a few hundred thousand lines of code and your compilation is slow, talk to me. If you got other problems, talk to me. I've, I bet that I can double or triple size of the code base of any one of you. And there is a plenty of more. Maybe I will add one zero at the end because the code base that I'm working on right now to provide the tooling is probably like the second or maybe the biggest Scala code base in the world. And this is more than Scala because we got quite big uh, compilation plugin based on Scala async. So what we get here, if we want to write this amount of code with normal Scala, I think we will, be, uh, we will like move over the 10 million lines of code of Scala code. There is like various of problems, multiple developers, nasty stuff. I did a talk about it like long, long time ago when it was like way smaller during the first edition of Scala Sphere. And if you are interested, we can talk later on. But this is not the topic of this, this presentation. I'm from Virtus Lab and we are trying to support community as much as we could, could like for example, running this meetup. Uh, there is other options, like if you are interested in different language like TypeScript or Kotlin, we are also organizing meetups there, a lot of initiatives. And the biggest one is the Sphere IT, where it's the unusual conference, where we got multiple spheres, multiple nice developers. It's not like Decon, that is like all Java. It's like completely different topics like Scala tooling, uh, reactive uh, programming, data, or cloud architectures. All in one place in October this year. Strongly recommend to, to, to join there. I'm like, maybe I should not say that because I'm part of like one of the organizers of the conference. But anyway, we will have for sure some discount and some raffles to win the tickets on this group. So follow uh, up our Twitters and Facebook accounts and you, you will be able to get like a cheaper or even free ticket. So if you want to get the slides, there is not much on the slides, but if you are really interested to see the, there is maybe a few references that might be useful, but not technical one, you can go to, to my GitHub page and, 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 and get that. So yeah, that's the introduction. Now let's come to the, 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 the actual talk. It's a context body. This is a tool that knows your code better than you. I know this is a bold statement. He, <laughs> the, the tool, the context body, is not able, it may be got the knowledge, but it does not know the code because we are still processing the knowledge, processing the data. But I think we are on good, good, good path. So, during the, my, uh, as my experience from working with this huge repo, like one of the responsibilities was actually trying to unblock users. So they got the problem, something is broken, there is no one to talk to. So there was a reason people sometimes like wait a month to get their PR merged because there was like different problems on the CIs and they have no idea what's going on. So the solution was actually there is no tools around that can help. So they throw people on the problems, especially my team as well. So we got like Rotas and trying to help people. And one of the biggest problems that we got is actually try to dig out in the code. So the project is like 10 years old, so there is a lot of the fossil code. It's not like it's bad code, it's like, you know, it's just old code. So probably the, uh, the guy that wrote that code for some specific reason, like, you know, leave the firm five years ago. And uh, there was the other pickup, refactor it a bit, without much knowledge, but there was like a bug that needs to be fixed. So they like, there's a patches on the code all over the place, and you have no clear owner, you have no idea what's going on there. Uh, also, there was like in many instances where code was formatted at some point. Like super, super trivial thing, like the Scala FMT was a big thing like two years ago and still is. But actually it makes that half of your history in Git at some point is one commit. It's the commit that changed formatting. And then you stuck into that and you got the problem. Another thing, the same case is when you got the shallow clone. Do you, is there like anyone here that knows what shallow clone in Git is? Okay, so shallow clone is basically the think that you don't, you don't have to clone the whole history, but it's just cut at some point. That is why it's shallow. But the problem of that is like, okay, the, the repository is smaller. For most of the project, this is like, you should not do that because the, the, the code is like small enough so it can be like quite fast check, 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 checked out from the repository. In our case, full checkout of the full history, like few hundred thousands of commits and all the branches and, and everything in between probably will take like 10 hours. So we have to do a, a shallow clones. And the biggest problem with shallow clones is that if the change in your light was like changed before the point that you could have the history, there is like a random commit that is a root of every, like 90% of lines in your application. And this is a big of a problem, isn't it? Like, 
also, there is like a cases where um, you are thrown on new stuff and you have no idea what's going on. Or there is a cases like, I, I'm pretty sure that in every project, maybe if it is like, I don't know, two months old, there is a code duplication. There is a method that is doing exactly the same in two different places. In terms of microservices, where you got the small teams, this is like pretty common uh, thing. That, and this is not because like we are as a programmer are not good enough to pick the problems. It's mainly because we are not communicating. We are, do not know. We have no idea that this something is there. Another big problem that, that I try to solve is like, have you ever tried to build a plugin for IntelliJ? There is a few guys here, and they probably share the same experience. It's like, everything is there. Everything you need. The only problem is that you need to find it. So I have to like, develop a technique where I like, look on something on the screen that is similar or working the same, try to find out like, a message. You know, like, let's say it's like a commit window. So I just copy that text and try to find resources, and through resources I get to the class I, I need to get. This is like pretty primitive. We, we can do better. And all of that remind me this. This is a thing that people dig in the ground. This is a fossil. And this got a really nice name. It's like the devil corkscrew. It was like discovered by scientists like over 100 years ago. And there was a problem. They had no idea what is that. Because there is, this is for sure something that like some kind of living creature made. Because it's like symmetrical. It makes no sense. It's like, you know, it's too, like, it's too much like a corkscrew. Like, there is a spiral, but it's pretty much quite even. But there is no reason for any plant or anything to grow like that. So there was a big puzzle. And in many cases, our, our code is the same puzzle. Let me show you such case. So this is Zinc. Zinc is an incremental compiler for Scala. This, Zinc, this is the thing that makes your life as a Scala programmer variable, easy. I don't know. This is because if not, you will do a full compilation every time you do that. And the method I'm showing here, the cycle, is like a core of course of Zinc. This is the thing that actually runs the compilation over and over again. And uh, it tries to find out what is wrong, what needs to be recompiled, and so forth and so on. And there is this nice thing called X class file manager. And you have, what is that? Is it like a, some kind of spring thing? Like why I need to manage files and class files even? So what I do usually to get to the bottom of that, I can go to the code and there is just no documentation as always. Like in the core of our applications, pretty much there is no documentation because even if there is documentation, in most cases it's outdated because it's really hard to keep like, the actual precise documentation up to date with the code changes, especially when you are under a pressure and you have to provide the fixes, like next hour. So what, what we can do? We can, do, we can go like git blame. IntelliJ got a really nice uh, way to do a git blame. There is this annotate. So it points me to a commit. OK, so there is a commit, and it says that I just prefix x with some class from package. Really useful. Now I know what is there. Why, why is there? OK. Is there a factoring? So I can do right now, I can do a git blame, and I can use like a tilde assigned and a number of commits so I can go like back in the history. I can do that in the command line, but this is nasty because like git blame out from command line is not really readable because it's like really wide. I, I would need like a two, two, two uh, screen like two, two times wider to actually get a nice readable view. Not because the code is long, because it's like there is a lot of stuff there. But in I got this really nice thing that is annotate previous revision. So it basically come back in the history to the point where before that revision. So now I can see there is, okay, there is a big block of code from Jorge. Jorge is one of the maintainer of Zing right now. And what is said is reformat. And then, okay, another. Let's dig some more. And, you know, oh, changed. There is, like, okay, there is this guy named Vank that changed something. So let's go back in the history. And it's still there. And you can dig, 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 dig down the code. And maybe after, like, fifth or sixth or maybe second, maybe sometimes twice, maybe in the second stroke, if we're lucky, we will get to the bottom, we'll get the commit, and yeah, we'll be good. And it was the same story with that thing. So people actually was trying to find out what was there. There was, like, different hypotheses. There's more and more finds like, like this in the area. And this is from Nebraska. Maybe you would, like, recognize the pattern of like, the clothes that this guy wore. And there was like idea there's like a sponge that lives in the sea. There is like a something that grows around the trunks of the trees. But there, scientists try to find more and more bones of small creature. And uh, then they first they ignore that because like okay, it's just random pieces of bone. It might happen like it was a forest probably, so the bones is a normal thing, especially if this is a root. 
But then was like more and more of the bones, and they found they actually start start finding the bones inside that thing. So after years of research, the same thing as we do with the uh, digging in the Git history, it find out this is not a fossil. This is not a living thing. This is a burrow of a little creature that is called the paleocastor. This is kind of dry land uh, a beaver that lives there, and they dig this kind of deep burrows, and they use the spiral shape because it's like when you dig deep and you want to dig straight. This is the only way that you can go down because if there's like a straight line, it will just dig and then die because there is like it can get get out. A lot of people from Minecraft fell into that. I've heard. I'm, I'm not a Minecraft player, and also the, this, this shape gives a nice thing because it's really good in air ventilation because there is not in a, there is not much air coming from the outside, and the ground around it makes it like really nice and comfortable place to live, and the climate back then in Nebraska wasn't really pleasant. So, yeah. We can do that. There's more in this link. There's a really nice story about the paleocaster and all the, the, the science. I probably messed up some ideas, some, some stuff here. And um, do we really need to dig that deep as this paleocaster into the kit history? Or do the, a lot of research as our paleontist, uh, paleontologists to actually get to the bottom of the problem? I think not. I think we can do better. And this is the place where context body starts. So just meet context body. Let's do some demo. So uh, we got here, let's come back to the original code. We got here the, our code that is now no annotated rest on the current history. And we really want to know who added the class file manager into that stuff. So with context body, you got this nice switch. By default, it's on, but just for representation, I have to turn it off. That is called the smart history. And with that, I don't know if you are able to see that, because to be honest, I was the f this is the first time I'm showing this on the presentation mode. And the uh, dots and the underscores uh, I, I used there is probably like way too small for representation mode. But there is on the left side, there is a lot of like colorful dots. And a lot of the, the thing in the code is uh, underscore, is, is, is there, there is the uh, lines with different colors. And so what is that? This is actually the history of the each actual token in the code. So I can look here. And this is like a commit from Piotr. Uh, I can look on my class file manager. So OK, you remember the first commit, adding x to the type? It is there. And also, there is a really long, really old commit from, uh, whoa, 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 really, really old, like 70s? <laughs> Something is broken with the timestamp here. Uh, it's probably like a zero. <laughs> it was like from the uh, beginning of programming. Uh, from Grzegorz Kosakowski. That was actually author of the, that thing. and. Uh, you might think how I compute that. So to get that, I look at the history of file of the code completely different. Not like as a lines, but instead, like I've got an idea that I, if I represent a code, especially Scala code, as just a stream of the tokens. What I mean by token? The annotation is a token, the keyword is a token, the name of the method, everything that makes your program is a token. So when I write the tokens as is like each one in the line, then whenever the code changes, I can just div those, those 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 sets of tokens. And it means that, OK, if there is a line with multiple parameters, as we see before, and sometimes just introduce a new one, it just changes the history of that token. If there is a reformat, I completely ignore the white spaces. So almost completely ignore the white spaces. Of course, if you just merge, like for example, two names into one, it will be picked. But the formatting is not affected. Uh, it's not affecting the, the tool. So you might think, OK, that's not a big thing. But if you f keep in mind that there is like a big project with deep history like Zinc, uh, it is really useful. But this is just the beginning. So do you remember that thing? So it turns out it was not a fossil. So it was not a part of a living feature, uh, creature. It was the uh, something that was created by a actual living creature. And there's more stuff. This got a name. This is like called the trace fossils. And most obvious thing is like the footsteps. Like probably all of you see this kind of, like on support photos, maybe live, uh, this kind of footstep of some dinos. But there's like others. There was like a complete creature that was like printed alongside the road. There was like pieces when the skin was there. Or even there's like more exotic one, like fossilized poo of some dinosaurs. Uh, so, <laughs> I want to say that this is inspiring me, but this is like the trace fossil. It's really 
uh, good uh, similarity what what I what I've got more in the context body. So in our code, we can think of the the tokens I just showed you before as a bonus of the code that does actually carry everything. But there is plenty of information that is not there in the code. There are types, for example, one of the most important ones. We've got implicits that are there, not not visible. We've got uh, each of if there is something that comes from not your project, not your file, but some jar. The origin of that thing is really important. Have you ever got the problems with class path? That something like someone add, uh, add, add something on the class path and it breaks everything? Yes, and there is no change in the code. How we can detect that? And this is where context body can help you. So let me show you the uh, different workspace. Smaller one that I use for testing. And uh, you might notice that there is a big piece of configuration, like to show different contexts. That's a hint. Yes, we've got multiple contexts for a smart history. So the problem here is that, uh, please ignore this everything beyond the, be, uh, just we think about this map hell as the, uh, the problem. So we got our map hell, there's like a caching stuff going on. Probably we should not use caching, but sometimes you have to use caching in order to be efficient. I probably should not show you that there is a mutable map in the Scala uh, Scala meetup, but hey, I'm not, I, I'm using some sometimes because sometimes performance is important. So we got this thing, it works, pass all the CI tests, some users start using that, everything is fine, it goes on the production and there is a big hint in terms of like how many users are accessing our website. And the website is really slow. What's going on? We do profiling, profiling, profiling and we find out that there is a big problem here. So every time we create a cache, that's supposed to cache this compute other heavy thing, uh, like compute it once and then like you reuse that, it doing it over and over and over and over again. And okay, so we think sometimes broke something, this should this is like a really trivial thing. Nope. When you see on the, the changes, there is only two lines that changes here. There is some change here that is completely unrelated. Keep in mind that there is like three hundred lines of code in between those two. And there is like some minor probably formatting change on top. What happened here? What is the problem? It used to work because there was bigger spikes and it was fast. So we can go and analyze the history or we can ask context body for help. So we can change the context of the history into types. And then you might notice that we got the two dots here. So even though there was not, no change in the code itself, it detects that there is a change here. And why? There is a change. There is a, so the commit that introduced many, many problems is actually affecting those, those, those things. During the presentation, I realized I'm missing really important uh, piece of the context body that we add before the Scala base for sure. It's, uh, I will need to go and see the change because right now, if I go, just go there and I've got the change that the token here, you might not be able to see it, like here. And it changed the, from the uh, Scala collection immutable into Scala collection mutable, what was there before, I will know for sure what's going on. Because the change that was introduced here was there was an import on top for mutable map and those map was not prefixed here. Why it changed everything? Because if we got a mutable map, then uh, sorry, with default, actually cache the result. But if you got immutable map, with default, compute that all over and over again. And there is no, there's nothing that can pick up that because the type is narrowed down here into just collection map. So that is one of the use cases where actually when types and inspecting types that are not there in the code that you have to go manually and go through the history and try to find what's changed will be, it's, it's useful. Next thing, because this is not the, this is not the only one that I've got, uh, sorry. We've got something that is called definition types because the types, okay, are good, but they also can change like the definition where something comes from. And similar case, someone changed something here and then it breaks here. Instead of like, let's say, usually got five here, we got one. Sorry, we got one and now we got five. What happened? We changed us like some base trait somewhere and they it just simply changed the type from a set that used to be there, it was changed to seek, which means when you got multiple uh, uh, arguments that are the same, they will just make it like just one, one element because they will just remove the du duplicates. 
And like when you look on the code, it's, it might be really hard to pick it up. But when you just you know turn the smart history context, and then you got that okay, there is a change. There is the the change in the definition of the type. There is more. Remember, I mentioned the uh, problems with the class path. We got the we got something that can help us here. It's called the origins, and it basically checks the where given symbol comes from in terms of jar. So let's, if, you, if we go and see here, this is all initial commits. So there was no change in that file whatsoever. And we see a problem with that. What happened? It turns out that the other time was updated into some older version of newer and whatever. And this is the change that might affect your production. Those are the kind of changes that, especially with the minor version, uh, that uh, are not changing the APIs, but changing the implementation, fixing the bugs. When something with bugs is introduced, you might notice it only on the production during the high load. And the last one I can want to show you, it's, it's my favorite. It's called synthesis. So it's basically the stuff that Scala adds to our code. So you might notice that it's the same case as for the uh, definitions. And uh, synthesis, synthesis can also help us here. Why? Because the implicit change. And implicit are not visible in the code but context body knows the implicits. The rendering here is terrible. I just, one of the another thing that I need to fix. So it's still under the, uh, under the construction, but the engine is there. And have you ever got the problems with auto tapping? Do you know what auto tapping in Scala is? So for those that, does, that do, do not know, auto tapping is a feature of Scala compiler, feature, I think bug, but it's a feature apparently. Whenever you got, a um, method that accepts something that traits uh, that tuple match to. And for example, you got, a, like with here, with the date time, you got constructor that accept like seven ints or five, but not six, but there is a constructor that accept any. So if Scala is not able to find like a normal method, but see something that tuples my fit, it wraps all these arguments here into a tuple and insert there. So the case was the same. Nothing changed in the code. Only changed the version of uh, Yoda time. And in the version that was there before, there was a constructor that accepts six ints. In the newer one, there is no such constructor. But there is a constructor that accepts object. Tuple is an object. So I can tuple that and pass to the Yoda time. And you are not, this, is, this kind of bugs are really hard to find. But if you got the synthesis, you can just go there. OK. If you go, you have to believe me, there is somewhere here. Yes, it says tuple six. So it detects that thing. So that's context body. That's what is there. It is not open source. This is a big, there's a few reasons why it's not open source or not open to the public yet. Because I think at some point it will be. Uh, I, do really, I don't really want to, because this is not ready to use on a daily basis. Not because it's not working, not because it's broken, but the way to actually generate data if you think about that, to provide the, the, the caches and everything and being up to date with the code is probably the hardest part. And I need to play, need to do some early adopters, not the public beta, because if I just open it, like promise a lot and people will start complaining in the emails and I will probably, the only thing I will do instead of developing the thing and trying to be productive, I will just need to like reply to the emails, try to debug stuff and so on and so forth. Probably many times the same thing. Uh, that is why we will run it as a closed beta. So if you are interested, reach me, either using this context body at virtuslab.com, or you can join, like, find me on Gitter, mention I really want to try it. You can try me on, 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 on Twitter, or just, you know, grab me somewhere here or somewhere. I'll, I'm really open for, for, for discussion, but I, in exchange for actually using the tool for, the, for now, I really want some information about your workflow, what is needed, because I really need to pick the defaults. Because if you think about that, if you ever build something that lives together with your project, it's really hard to pick the defaults correctly, to pick the way where the cache should be generated, where the cache should not be generated, and so forth and so on. At some point, I'm pretty sure that the, the thing I showed you, it will be for free for sure. There is more, I'm not sure about more, because uh, context body will be a part of bigger thing that we are developing at Virtus Lab. I cannot say more right now, but it will be like way, 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 way bigger than this thing. So I cannot promise anything. So let's talk about future. Not future of T, I should mention. Sorry, I missed the opportunity to make a joke. Uh, 
uh, about future context body. So you might wonder why I put here this thing. This is like abandoned city of Machu Picchu, and this has nothing to do with the future. Maybe except like many of you want to go there in the future. Uh, so when I was there like two years ago, one of the tourist guides shared this like really nice heartwarming stories. Story. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't care at this point. But it was really nice that in the Inca times, uh, the way how the people lived there was like you were worker. Like for example, you were a stonemason that builds these beautiful buildings that you can see here. The way they fit the stones together with like primitive stories, like amazing. And those buildings are able to withstand the earthquakes, where like we as a, like you know West civilization are not able to do so for like long time. And the way how they worked was like after let's say 20 years of work, this was really dangerous work in many cases. So not many people like live to the retirement. Let's say you stop working, like stop putting the stones, but you start learning, like young guys, how to build the stones. So there was like a schools. The teacher was actually guys that retired and they passed the knowledge. And I thought, oh, this is really nice. This is really clever. And then I think a bit more about that, and we are doing the same as the software developers. You come to the project, there is a senior developer that is actually guiding you, showing you everything. The knowledge is mostly passed as the experience that is shared, that you describe, you have to learn it from by heart. Okay, you might say, there is a documentation. If you got really good developer documentation that explained deeply architecture, that explained all the things that was there hacked at some point because to solve this really strange business case that is really up to date, then I view you. I really want to be in that project. In most cases, there is, an, uh, there is a good documentation if you are a library that is used by many cases, or there is a good documentation how to install, how to run this thing. Maybe there is a documentation how to set up a project if setup is not, not, not is tricky, or there might be like guidelines of the architecture on top level, or like some JIRAs. That's all. And if you think about the Incas, like the, when the Spaniard came, and they conquered them like a few years. One of the things that was like really visible was there, they were really, really advanced technologically. And why, why is that? Because Incas that cannot write. They have no writing. So, and I think this is the case for us as well. We lack the tool to actually gather the knowledge, preserve the knowledge about the project, and pass it to another gen generations of programmers. So when you got the bus factor, it's no longer such a big threat as it is right now. Or as Cuba, that was speaking here a month ago, put a nicely conference factor. So the project is dead if the like I don't know, ten to, to, to two developers are on the conference and do not care about the emails. So how context body help here? We've got the data. If you think about the history I just showed you about the tokens, the types, and everything, that's the data. You just need to wait how to store, preserve, and query those data. And this is what I'm doing right now. I got some. Results, they are not ready, especially the UIs and stuff are not ready to present, but I get some results and it will work, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and with that, I think we'll be able to, maybe not to aim for like, you know, ultimate writing of the knowledge about the code. This, this is like far away from what I think. What I really want to achieve right now is I really want to be for context body is something that you can, you know, select a code, piece of code in your IDE, say, Tell me something about this code, this code. And you will get like a list of people to talk to. You will get like a list of JIRAs that might be affected into that code. You will get a pre review, uh, uh, code reviews that were, there is a many of explanation that comes in the code review comments and more. So that's, that's where I am with context body. And like when you realize how much potential is there with that simple thing, for example, do you have a problem that when you do a pull request, you don't know who should review that? And it's really hard to find a good reviewer for the code. In the big project I mentioned, we got like a tool based on the regular expression and project names and files name, but they are rubbish. There is basically like something that works, but is not good enough. With that working, I can use like okay, the changes in the code is pretty much the same thing as you assign some code, like select some code in the IDE, and with that information, it can just pick the correct reviewers for the task. They can find the code duplication and many, many more things. There is one drawback of that, because I said, yeah, I've got, I've got some results, but the results are not as good as, as I expected. And in order, so we got the, 
the, the code, we're analyzing the code that is there. Like I can go through the history, gather all data, run multiple, you know, build vector, support vector machines, or other crazy ML stuff. And I will still miss a lot of knowledge. Why? Let me tell you a story about the bomber, bombers during the Second World War. So as you can see, they sometimes come to base or not. There was like really heavy battle. There was a really tense fight there. And since there was like a 10 people or eight people in that thing flying and it cost a lot, when it's like shoot down and fell down or like half of the, the crew is killed, there is like a big cost. And of course, there's a people killed. So United States uh, 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 Army tried to find out a way how they can make the bombers less vulnerable to the fire. So they, they decided they would put like some armor, armor on them. They got plenty of fuel, so adding some more kilograms of ton or tons to the plane was not that big of a deal for them. And uh, you cannot armor the whole plane because it would be like way too heavy to fly. So they have to find a way, let's say, how to, where to put like 20% of the how, the, how we can distribute the armor ar around, uh, 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 around the plane. So they, they gathered a team of really good math statisticians back then. And one of the things they did is actually they created cars where they could the, 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 the mechanics and the guys have to mark every, every damage that was inflicted by a bullet in the flight. And they gathered the data. There was no computer back then. So imagine there was like hundreds of thousands of those data. They have to like manually gather them and put them on the, collect them and show them to the generals. We got something. And it turns out something like that. So there is like the damage on the like edge of the wings, the, the tail wing, and uh, in the middle of the plane. The generals was happy. OK, we will put armor here. That's the best place to put our armor. And they almost did it. And it would be like really, really bad idea. Why is that? Because of the something that is called the survivorship bias. Because all the data that they got there was from the, the plane that survived the, the, the flight. So what it means that they got all this damage here, and they were able to manage to come back to the base. So what should be armored is the places there was like no hits. And if you think about it, like, you know, you have any data, it's like, okay, the pilot cabin is probably the most important, the engines, there are the fuel tanks here, and this plane, this piece is like quite uh, thin, so if it's like, you know, turned out, the plane go into spiral and go down. And I think we got the same in our coach, in our coach. Because this is like the list of the comets from Scala, quite recent one. And as you can see, the green ticks around each comet. When you look at the code in our, in our repositories, what, what we learn, what we get, what, what we try to analyze, this is, this is the code that survives the CIs, or even not survives the CIs. Survives the type when you type the code locally, run the test, debug it locally. So a lot of mistakes that was made by you or by the infrastructure bugs that was there are not here because they are fixed. So that was the reason why, I, why the result I've got was not perfect. And this is the next thing that I want to put into the context body. So generally, in order to learn about your code, you really have to go through the, all the pool that you generate during the development. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got any questions, hit me anytime you want. No, no, it's, it can use LSP, uh, I think. I don't know if the IPI is there. Maybe you can ex ex extend the ISP. For now, I'm using IntelliJ because it's the platform I know most and it's the easiest to extend because I just create a plugin that lives with that, with that thing. And it's also, I can write that plugins in Scala. But the, there is not much thing that is really related to the editors. Just the presentation and, you know, maybe some, uh, like uh, turning it off, on, and maybe some triggers for a compilation because I need to, you know, when I have to refresh the, the, the data. Okay, and uh, I guess it's uh, Scala only, right? Uh, for now, I'm, the, most of the features I've got there is are for Scala. Uh, I've got some for Java, and there is nothing except for, because the engine is really uh, language independent. There is like not, nothing really tied to Scala. Because the idea is here that I've got multiple views on the project data, and then you just need to provide a kind of way to extract that data from the code. So for now, I'm using mostly the just parsing the Scala code to get tokens. Uh, I'm using SemanticDB quite heavily, and I also got some my own fixes. Uh, I've did some fixes for Java, but 
I just focus focus for Java. So in the future version, yes, I think the uh, Java is one thing, and I got the feeling that the real big market for this kind of thing is TypeScript or JavaScript. Because there is like, with Scala, we got a lot of information from the types. There, not so much. Yes, that is the thing because uh, we are, uh, my colleague is one of the main uh, maintainers of Metal, Tomek, and we discussed this basically today. So the problem is that Metals is not ready to accept any plugins, so I cannot like live within the Metals. I would need to, there's some way that we can, you know, make it work. Uh, I'm with good contact with both Scala Center and Olaf, so once I'm ready, I can show them, they will see the value in that, we can talk how to make a plugins for LSP. Uh, for metals and how we can use that with metals because it's just a matter of integration. There is nothing in the engine that is really tied to IntelliJ or Scala. So basically, okay, so the origins, uh, Krzysztof asked about like what, how I get the origins, the jars. So basically during the compiler, this is the thing I need to like hack into the compiler. Uh, like as, I actually I hijacked the, uh, for now I just hijacked the uh, semantic DB generator and that's some more stuff in there because they got like quite infrastructure for those. Uh, but it can be quite easily like moved to the separate library. In every symbol inside Scala C, you got uh, a pointer to the source where it came from. It's either a source file or a, a entry in a jar. So with that, I can quite easily extract the jar. The thing missing here is because I am using the just paths, just absolute paths as on the drive. And they are not that useful, but I also got a plugin for SB, uh, SBT. I'm developing for that. And I can, with that, I can quite easily match the uh, jar, like a path on the drive, into actual definition of library. And this is the next step I want to implement here. And this works with Java as well. It will. I mean, there is nothing. It's just missing implementation because it's mostly based on Git-like tools, and Git is able to handle the rename, so I will be able to do so. Yes, so if, if, you, if, you, if Git recognizes that there is a rename, there is no reason I can, because I won't be able to, maybe it will be even easier, I have to play with that, on the token, tok tokens level, for example, to get whether this is like the same file or not, but I got that information from Git, if there is a Git. So if Git recognizes there is a rename, then I can use that information, just, you know, bypass the information from the old one. Uh, and uh, for, if Git does not recognize there is a rename, it means, that you, you can tell Git that there is a rename manually. And uh, if, if you don't do that and there is a, just a rename and there is like beyond, beyond the threshold, it means probably the rename is like, so the changes are so big that the, the rename is just, you know, in your head or something. Yeah, I think it's very, uh, very common. Yes. In the tension level, is not the problem. Well, yeah, I, 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 I guess, but, but then some formatting can change, and uh, you, you can have the same files fit into multiple files. So yes, Git won't handle that. Git won't handle that. That's, that's, the, that's the thing which causes the, mo the most problems. Uh, I know, yeah. and this is really good case to support, and probably I will add it to my list second after the renames. Because yeah, this is quite common to extract code into the different class, and this is actually good practice to make your files smaller as, as, as possible. Maybe not as possible, but small. What instead are you going to govern this for the for the aeroplane data? Uh, you mean that one? I don't know. I I I will I will I will find it. I will find a good threshold or something like memory is cheap, and and storage is even cheaper. So, <laughs> and actually, there is a way to. Because the data is mostly incremental. 
So there is not like I have to store like few hundred copies of the same code over and over again. It's mostly like a small increment. So with good reusing, I think it will be reasonable. If not, then I will have to change my approach or something or make it more compact or try to uh, analyze what data is really important and which, which is just a garbage. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you for listening. You can grab me. I, I won't stay here, so if you've got like some other questions.